My name is Ted Jackson with the Times Picayune. Monday morning, as the storm was still blowing through, I was anxious to get out into the city and see what damage had been done. And so I made my way to the French Quarter and shot pictures of the St. Louis Cathedral and and uh, the Superdome roof and um, and Canal Street, the wind blowing there, and and made it back to the um, uh, the office to report back of what I'd seen because all the cell phones were down. No, there was no communication at all. So I was the eyes of the of the the newsroom at the at the time. And uh, as soon as I got back, gave them the pictures. We looked at them just for a few minutes, and uh, someone said, "We've heard that the uh, uh, lower ninth ward might be flooding. Do you think you could possibly get out there?" And so I thought, well. I don't know, but it was it was a good trip out just now, so I'll, I'll, I'll try. Went towards the, the Ninth Ward on the interstate again, and I uh, got off at uh, Basin Street, and that's I, I saw my first looters at that point. The, the storm was still blowing uh, hurricane force, and people were already looting. And uh, that was very discouraging to me because... You know, in hindsight, you know, people talk about well, people. A lot of people were looting because they they had to have food and, and and water and those kinds of things. Well, that's not what these people were doing. These people were taking advantage of the opportunity. So it was very discouraging and depressing. But I, I shot pictures of it, and uh, one of the looters spotted me and jumped in his car and and headed towards me, and I didn't have time to get away. And uh, he pulled his window right up to my window, and I, I honestly thought he was going to pull a gun and, and shoot me right there. I, I just it, it had that feeling about it. It was so dramatic and quick. But he was he had he had seen me shooting pictures, and he was rushing over to convince me that he was not looting, that he was just a victim, like like any like anybody else would have been in that in that moment. He just was trying to park his car there. That he was not loading it with, with loot, and I just told him, "I believe you. I believe you. Just, you know, it's okay." So he left, and as he's driving away, he's yelling back over his shoulder, I, "I'm not a looter." <laughs> and I finally found my way to the, the, um, the high ground against the levee, and drove all the way to Poland Avenue. Got out of my truck, and that was as far as I could get. And I walked about three or four blocks, whatever that would be from the levee to, um, to the St. Claude Bridge. And walked across it to see what this flooding was going to be like. And, you know, when they say flooding, typical New Orleans flooding in, in a heavy, heavy rain is what I expected to see. I expected to see, you know, street flooding and probably some in the houses. And... Um, and that was going to be the, the picture that, uh, that I'd make. And when I crossed the bridge and saw water up to the, the, the rain gutters, to the eaves and over the roofs, it was just stunning. And, uh, but, you know, you, as journalists, you react, you know, with, with, with one sense and then you start working with your other senses. And there wasn't much time to... To really digest what you were seeing, you just started shooting pictures, and and the very first thing that I saw was a family clinging to their porch, right to the right of the bridge where I was standing, and um, they were calling out to me for help. And like I said, you know, I'm I'm the only one out. The hurricane is still blowing. I asked them how long they had been standing there on the porch, and they said uh, they'd been there since since 8 o'clock that morning, which uh, that was about uh, 1230. And so uh, four and a half, going on five hours, they'd been standing on the porch, and the water was up to their chest. And I suddenly, it suddenly dawned on me that uh, the, the top of the front door to their house right behind them was below their shoulders. You could see it. That uh, that they were not standing on the front porch. They were they're balancing themselves on the rail of the porch, and they had children with them, who at least two of them would not be able to reach the rail. 
and so they were balancing them and, and holding them up and and uh, so they were they were very desperate and had been there for a long time and they were just still pleading to me to, to help them somehow and uh, there was a raging current between us going down the street I was looking around for anything that would float or I'm thinking should I try to wade across this this water and you quickly realize how deep it was it was just no way and the current was so swift there was no way I could get across to them if I only had a rope maybe that would maybe that would work and uh, there was just no resources anywhere and they had captured a log that was floating by them and their idea was to put the little girl on this log to, to have her hold on to the log and they wanted to push her across the street to me and for me to catch them and uh, it was it was very clear that this current was going to wash this little girl away and so I just begged them not to do that and they were very desperate and I, I knew that if I stood there and watched this, I was about to watch a tragedy happen. And I'm deciding that I cannot help these people. Um, there's nothing to do but to encourage them to stay where they were, try to talk some sense into them, and just, you know, as hard as it is, you've got to stay where you are. And... But then I decided I'm, I got, I've got to leave, but my editors, again, need to see what's happening here, so I've got to shoot a picture. Now I'm in a really bad situation where, you know, I, I don't want to shoot this picture, but I've got to. And I don't want to cause them more trauma, but I've got to shoot the picture. So I went back to the newspaper, and I gave them my card, and um, I said I've got to go back. They asked me if I would take a reporter with me this time. And uh, so I, I grabbed Brian Teveno and we headed out the door. But on the way out, I grabbed uh, an inflatable boat and a, uh, a length of rope that I had brought and threw it in the back of the truck. And we jumped in the truck and headed out and had a conversation with Brian. Uh, it, was, it was just it was really upsetting at this point. Um, trying to describe to him what I had just seen and I said Brian I've got to ask you a question I said when we get back to the St. Cloud Bridge I said if we have to make a choice between getting a story and rescuing people I said I'm rescuing people first I said are you okay with that and he said yeah and so I felt better about that so we're going back to find these people and by this time there were more people there there were rescue there were about two or three rescue boats work in the water that I could see at this point. Um, NOPD and SWAT team and a couple of uh, individual citizens in some boats. But the first SWAT team boat that I saw come up with um, with, with people in the boat, um, I asked them if they had gotten the people off the front, the, the porch because they were now gone. And they said, no, we We've been here for about 30 minutes. We didn't see anybody there at all. And uh, so I just, my heart sank, and I just assumed that the worst had happened because they were so desperate to get off the porch. And um, Tevino and I found, we, we waited and we shot some more pictures, and we waited until a, a, a citizen drove up in a, a yellow boat and uh, we begged him to give us a ride and let us go with him. Of course, this is a uh, ethical decision you've got to wrestle with, too, because you know that you being in a boat means that someone may not get rescued because of you. And so we uh, convinced him that, uh, you know, that we needed to, to be out in the boat seeing the rescues. And, but we knew very well that, you know, he may choose to leave us on a rooftop if it meant it was us or them. And that happened to several photographers. And um, so we, we did that for the rest of the day. Ended up way down in St. Bernard Parish, across Parish Road. And um, we pulled people out of roof uh, rooftops, 
pulled people out of attics and second floor apartments and took them to a, um, a second floor of a bank and we spent about 30 minutes, 45 minutes or so collecting floating food coming out of a grocery store and water and taking it back to the people for them to uh, to, to have because they were going to be in that bank for a long time. It was very obvious. And finally made it back to the paper that night. Then I knew the next day was going to be another long day, but it was going to be clean up. It was going to be going out to back to St. Bernard and seeing the water gone and people pulling carpet out of their houses and all those kinds of things. And uh, so I wanted to get another good night's sleep, so I went to the library this night because now it was hot. There was no air conditioning in the building for the whole day, and that was really hot. And I just wanted some air around me. So I found a spot in the library floor to sleep. And um, I woke up the next morning with Elliot Kamenitz kicking my feet, saying, Ted, get up, the levees are broken. And that was the first news I had heard of that, even though some people in the building had known the night before. And I remember uh, someone yelling across the room. Well, El- Elliot said, wake up, Ted, the levees are broken. And someone across the room yelled, Jesus Christ. And someone else from across the room yelled, even Jesus can't help us now. Mm-hmm. A couple months after the storm, uh, it was, Thanksgiving was coming up, and some editors came up with a brilliant idea of doing a Thanksgiving piece on uh, storm victims who had been rescued and giving thanks to their rescuers. And they wanted to build that story uh, around the photographs that we had shot of people being rescued. And uh, the picture that I wanted so much to have included was the pictures of the people on the porch, Um, mostly because I wanted to know what had happened to them. But I didn't have their name. And so I headed back down to the Lower Ninth Ward, and I went to the house, and uh, of course it was just you know, the, the doors were blown out and everything was ruined inside. And I just kind of poked my head inside the front door and just kind of looked around to see if there was any sign of who had lived there. And I, I noticed some mail laying on the floor in the debris. And I saw a name. And so I took that name back um, to the, the writer and said, is there any way you can find this person um, you know, it, it may or may not be the resident uh, the, that's in the picture but you know give us a lead and she was able to find them they were uh, they were had evacuated to Houston and they had all been rescued off the porch by some teenagers and uh, teenagers were able to find a boat and get to them and so I got the phone number and called them and I just uh, I wanted, I wanted to hear their voice again, and to 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 know that they were okay, and and uh, we had a really good conversation over the phone, and and uh, the woman, um, she had a question for me. She said, "What we could not understand was why did you leave us after all that?" And I said, "Well, what you need to know." And I, I didn't want to say I didn't want to stand there and watch the daughter drown because I didn't think that would be very helpful. But I said, I just want you to know that I left and went and got a boat and some rope and I came back. And she said, oh, we didn't know that. So it turned into a much more pleasant conversation after that. And then as we finished up and then I was telling them goodbye, she said, uh, I've got one more question for you. Said so, uh, we would love to have a copy of that picture that you shot. We haven't seen it, and we'd like to have that to keep. And um, and that's always been a phenomenon to me that that, uh, that you don't understand the value of that picture when you're, or the, the the subjects don't understand the value of the picture when you're shooting them. It's it's very traumatic for them, and and we photographers need to be conscious of that. It's really important to understand that part of it, but. It's so much more helpful when you can explain to them why this picture is important now, because it's it's history and it's documentation, and and even they are typically going to want to remember this moment 
as horrific as, as, it, as, it, as it was. Um, but it's, it's hard to see that at the moment. By Wednesday, several photographers had banded together for safety reasons, and Thursday morning we heard there was a riot happening at the convention center, so we all headed that way. And we got to the street, Convention Center Boulevard, and made that corner thinking that we're about to get rushed and who knows what. So, you know, your legs better be ready to run. And uh, we made that last step, and people did rush us. But it was the total opposite welcome that uh, we expected. People were running to us and screaming, the press is here, the press is here. And uh, I don't remember if they said they'll tell our story, but I remember that so clearly. The press is here, they'll tell our story, they'll tell what's going on here. And um, we, had, we had made a pact with each other to stay together, but that was suddenly impossible because everybody that ran to us grabbed one of us by the, by the arm and said, I've got to show you this, I've got to show you that. And uh, the woman that grabbed me was named Angela Perkins. And she showed me an elderly man who had died in his lawn chair that was still on the median, covered in a blanket. And she showed me the bodies around the side. So we shot pictures of what we could see, and people sleeping on the floors, and it was just horrendous in there. And when we came back out the door, uh, she started uh, chanting trying to get the people to, uh, to chant with her. And she started uh, screaming, help us, help us, help us. And it was a, at that moment she pretty much um, dropped to her knees and screamed out, help us, please. And I shot that picture. Brett shot the picture. By now, Melissa Phillips was with us, and she, the three of us shot that picture. And it was... It was the crowning moment as a journalist, I think, because you realize that um, there were times when you couldn't help people, and but you shot their picture anyway. And then you realize there were times when you shot their picture and then you could help them. And then there was this moment that was so loud and clear that if you had brought them food and water, it wasn't going to help them like this picture was going to. That the picture was the help, and it was, it was a, it was a crowning moment, because she was not. I'm I'm a very religious person, and Brett and I were talking about what it, what was it she said? What what was the quote? And and we thought, did was she saying help us God? And it said no, she wasn't. She was. She wasn't praying to God. It was interesting that she was praying to the world through our lenses. And, uh, and uh, that, that was a very powerful moment 